afternoon, Professor Gonzalo Jerebet. He's an associate professor here of biology, and he's also the associate curator of invertebrates. Um, he did his undergraduate and graduate work at University of Barcelona, and his postdoctoral research at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. Um, just last week, he had an opening of the new exhibit here, um, Creatures That Rule, okay, arthropods, and next um, session, you'll have a chance and the opportunity to tour that and do a lab um, that focuses on looking at that exhibit, and it's also a lab that you'll be able to share with your students. Um, Professor Giravet will be speaking to you today along those same lines, and um, without further ado, two microphones that's a lot for me but uh, can you hear me fine yes. from the back yes okay so yeah, Tara mentioned that we just opened last Thursday a new exhibit at the museum, and actually that exhibit was uh, titled Arthropods, Creatures, and Rule, and since I'm supposed to talk to you about evolution in arthropods, I thought that I could just uh, follow the lines of that exhibit, also reuse a lot of the slides. I've been giving uh, three talks this week, three public talks, so it's good to reuse some of the books, but I think it's very uh, important for the topic we're going to do today. And I'm also going to try to talk about one very powerful thing in, uh, in evolutionary thought, which is the tree, the concept of a tree and the tree of life. And I think that it's very important that uh, your students understand that metaphor that relates organisms among each other. So we're going to see some aspects of arthropods. Uh, when you know, I was opening, or we were doing this thing for the opening of the exhibit, right before I gave the lecture, we went with the press, and the first question they asked is like, why arthropods are the creatures that rule? So that's one of the things that I'm also gonna try to uh, tell you, and to expose you to the diversity of arthropod uh, body plants, and it's something that you can use for you know, teaching your students about evolution, how you know, diversity, you know, Rob Lou talked about diversity, how important it is in human, uh, history and evolution, and you can see that there's groups of organisms where that um, diversity is just been taken to orders of magnitude uh, farther away. So we're going to be talking about arthropods. I hope that you all know what's an arthropod, but I'm going to try to explain you that along uh, the talk. But the first thing I mentioned is that we want to talk a little bit about what is a phylogenetic tree which is just a representation, you don't need to read any of the names there, but it's just a representation of how things are relating to each other. And we can present those things in many different ways. This is what we call generally an unrooted tree, so just their lines, and this is telling us that these organisms here and here are more closely related to each other than either one of those is to an animal that is in another part of the tree. And the same sort of representation we usually do with these uh, rooted trees, where they have an evolutionary direction uh, to them, okay? So the difference between unrooted and rooted trees will be evolution. Here, it tells us that these two groups are more closely related to anything else, except if we had the origin of that group somewhere in the middle of those branches. And that will change completely the direction of the trees. Uh, trees can be represented in many other ways, and the way that computers represent trees is in this parenthetical notation here. Just a series of parentheses that get opened. I open another one here, another one here, another one here, and at the end of it, you need to close as many as you have opened. So there's five openings there, and there's five closings here. And in fact, this tree is the same exact thing that this rooted tree over there and that this unrooted tree over here. So this is something powerful that we can use for relating, for showing how things are related. And you know, I don't want to go into a lot of the terminology, but I think that it's useful for you to, to have in mind that our trees represent entities in evolution, represent things that we call here A, B, C, and D. And those things might reflect some character states of those organisms. Imagine that C and D are white, and A and B are black. You know, that could be a color, a trait that we can place in that, in that tree. 
And when we have things that appear at the end of our trees, that's what we call terminals, or terminal taxa, or leaves of a tree, if you want. And then we have their ancestors. You know, C and D had a common ancestor. And that common ancestor generally reflected the traits that we observe in our descendants. So it's very important to understand that if we think that C and D share a common ancestor, that common ancestor probably was also white. And that's why it gave origin to two white descendants. Okay, so these are the things. And then we can trace other things, like somewhere along this line that we call an internal branch, there's been, if you want a mutation or an evolutionary change that has replaced this black for white color. Okay, so that's what these trees represent. And you can use that with a lot of information for your students when you're trying to make them understand how uh, you know, the evolution of hair in vertebrates, you know, and you can, you know, place organisms that don't have hair here and how somewhere along the line that gave origin to mammals, hair appeared. It's really powerful, they really understand it. You can, you know, place the little animals at the ends of the tree instead of having these letters. Uh, you can draw the actual characters that those organisms have. So we're going to see a few trees along the line. This is just one tree that we've published representing information about our centipedes. You know, we're studying evolution of centipedes and it's very interesting to have obviously all the species. This Lithobius forficatus, this is a typical centipede that you will find under stones in any place here in Massachusetts. And we have, you know, the different shapes of the different centipedes that are each part of the tree. And I think that all this visual information that you can place onto a tree is much more informative than any words that we can tell them about how these things change, uh, et cetera. You know, ignore all the other information, but if, if, you know, this actually represents the evolution of the actual characters that we've used for drawing this evolutionary tree of the centipedes, for example, okay? And you have here, the house centipedes that you probably also can find running around your schools. And um, so it's uh, a very important way. And we do a lot of the research that we do in my type of science, which we call systematics, is trying to infer evolutionary trees by using the morphological characters of those organisms, their behavior, or their DNA sequence data. And one of the things that you're going to see today in the lab is some chromatograms, you know, the sequences of some of these organisms. And what we do is take sequences of, let's say, the same genes for a set of different species, compare those sequences, and use those to draw these evolutionary trees. And that requires a lot of computational effort, and that's what we use supercomputers to do those things. And I think those are some of the things that you're going to see in the lab. And then you're going to go and see this uh, new arthropod exhibit that opened up last Thursday only for you know, the people that attended that lecture and some of the members. And it opened to the public only on Saturday. So it's really new. And I will encourage you, if you like it, to bring your students over there because there's a lot of questions about arthropod evolution and arthropod diversity that it's uh, very important. I think that making students, young students now also to appreciate just diversity of life, you know, in human populations or in, you know, biodiversity in general, it's going to be very important for those people later on to be more conscious about how we use the resources uh, on Earth, you know, how we're, you know, damaging a lot of ecosystems. And, and really, the only way to, to make them uh, think about that is just by appreciating how important is biodiversity and how bad would it be to lose a large fraction of biodiversity, or how about it is actually that we're losing that very large fraction of biodiversity. So why do we say that arthropods are creatures that rule? So I'm going to give you several uh, reasons for that. So the first one is that arthropods live everywhere. There's no doubt there's a lot of arthropods in this room right now, even though we don't see them. Okay? And they live from the very bottom of the ocean floor to the highest mountain peak that you can find. And they live, actually, a lot of them in the atmosphere. They live in Antarctica. In Antarctica, they live in all continents. And everywhere you go, there's always an arthropod. 
Do you know which one is the king of ubiquitousness of arthropods? Any guesses here? Huh? So people tend to think that are insects or you know in cockroaches they live in many places, but actually not because insects cannot live, do not live in the uh, in the oceans. So they're only terrestrial. It's something that has to live everywhere. And the group of arthropods that lives absolutely everywhere are mites and ticks, the acari. We have a deep sea acari that live at 8,000 meters below the surface. They live in the atmosphere and they can actually be everywhere. The dust mites, you've probably heard about them, you know, causing a lot of allergies uh, among other people to me. So they're absolutely everywhere. So we know that there's a group of animals that lives everywhere. Not any other group of animals, not any other phylum of animals can live in all the places where arthropods live. There's uh, other reasons also for saying that their creatures are ruled, and is that the biomass is huge compared to any other groups of organisms. And I know that sometimes it's hard to believe that little things can have more biomass than elephants. You know, you need a, a lot of ants to make an elephant, but there's many, many, many more ants than elephants. Okay? This is uh, some recent study that came out actually, it's, you know, it's studying the arthropods that are found in a typical lowland forest in Indonesia, like the ones who were doing uh, field work this past summer. And what they counted there is that the biomass of arthropods above ground, this is only looking at the canopy. There's a lot of other arthropods in the soil also, but just looking at the canopy, they found that the biomass of arthropods was about 23 kilos per hectare. It's a really large biomass for an animal living in those forests. Uh, obviously, if you find an elephant in that hectare, you know, it's going to weigh more. But, uh, but, they're gonna, but these things are going to be everywhere, and the density of elephants is going to be very, very low. There's no elephants in, in <laughs> Indonesia anyhow. It could be a rhino, but uh, just talking about a large animal. In terms of abundance, that same hectare has about 24 million individual arthropods, which is a lot of animals to count there. And if you look at the density of the leaf surface, there's about 200 individuals per each square meter of leaves, which is something like that. You know, there are numbers that are hard to imagine coming from this type of forest that we have here, but really the density of arthropods. And these lowland forests can go you know, for a long, long, long space. And again, we're only counting the ones that live on the canopy. I forgot to mention there's no elephants living on the canopy. <laughs> okay. So there's a lot of arthropods. But they don't only live in the canopy. That's the point of them. They can live uh, everywhere. Sorry. And I was mentioning that these are very new estimates from 2006. These are new scientific papers that came out this year. And these estimates are actually five to ten times larger than the previous estimates that have been done in other tropical rainforests. And these are much more accurate sampling methods that people are using right now. So what I was mentioning is that arthropods don't only live in the canopy. There's a very large and important part of the arthropod biomass that lives in the leaf litter, in the soil of the forest. They actually process all the carbon that gets there. And they're really important for the ecology of those uh, ecosystems. We know also that insects can fly, so they're found in many other places. Uh, there's no doubt that if you, you know, you've driven your car in a hot day in the summer and you see how many poor arthropods end up in your windshield, and you know, no other animals, maybe a bird now and then will end up there, but no other animals will end up in your windshield. And the other thing is that they also dominate a lot of these ecosystems that we don't, we're not aware of. And this is representing, these big pebbles here are actually representing the little minuscule sand grains that you will find all over the bottom of the oceans. If you go to the bottom of the oceans, there'll be sand or sediment everywhere. And in between those grains, there's a lot of animal diversity. Most of these things are microscopic. We won't see them with our naked eyes, but there's a lot of that biodiversity. And within that biodiversity, about 90% of the biomass are a few obscure groups of crustaceans and these uh, halocarid mites, which are actually very tiny but colorful groups of mites that live in these uh, marine sediments. 
So the largest part of the biomass of these um, sandy bottoms all over the world are again arthropods. There are places where other animals might take over. There's some bottoms in, in coal places like in Antarctica where you've probably seen some of these pictures of those uh, ophiroids. They look like starfish, sea stars, but they're not really sea stars and they can cover large extensions. But in general, most of the bottom of the oceans is just sand grains and they're full of these little things. So there's no doubt that you were to be dropped in any continent on the earth the first animal, you know, 99.9% .9 chances are that the first animal you will encounter is an arthropod. Now, if you were to be dropped in the ocean, which is a large part of the Earth's surface, you're probably not going to find an arthropod until you've reached the bottom, because there's not that many arthropods that live in the water column. You might find first things like squid or uh, fish, except if you're in certain areas where there's a lot of krill. And you know that krill also can be perhaps the most abundant organism or species on Earth. Okay, so, but you need to go to the places where there are upwellings and there are krill. If you're dropped in the Mediterranean, you're not going to find much krill over there. So, we know that they live everywhere. We know that they're a very important part of the biomass. Now, if we look at the number of species, that's another measure for us to say that they really rule. And we define uh, all the animal phyla. So animal phyla is a phylum, uh, phyla in plural, is a category that we use for defining organisms or animals that have the same body plan. So arthropods is a phylum, annelids is a phylum, uh, mollusks is a phylum. So if we divide all the phyla, there's a few of them that have a large proportion of the biomass, or la la sorry, large proportion of the number of species like mollusks, vertebrates, a few other phyla that have an importance, but basically 85% of the known species are arthropods. And we know only about one million arthropods. There are estimates that the number of arthropods out there is more than 10 million. Some people say that up to 100 million. Now those numbers are really hard to estimate, uh, but it is true that there's a lot of unknown diversity of arthropods. Now, it is also true that there's a lot of unknown diversity of other groups of microscopic animals. Probably not of vertebrates. We're very close to the actual number of them. You know, even if it increased by 10%, that you know, wouldn't have any significant impact here. But there's groups like the nematodes, where we probably know a fraction that is even lower than 1% of what they really are. Okay? But anyhow, for the number of known species, arthropods are by far the largest group of organisms. And the other question that we can ask, since we're looking at evolution and we want to put this thing in a historical perspective, is has this always been the case? So we know now that a lot of the diversity of arthropods is explained by insects, and insects live on land. But you might know that you're in the Cambrian, where uh, animal lives are flourishing in the oceans, there was no animals living on land. So what happened, for example, in the Cambrian oceans? Well, we know that back then, you know, the continents looked very different from what they look now. There were a lot of organisms that have been preserved in the fossil record. And most of those organisms are actually arthropods, like the two ones that we see here, or animals that are related to arthropods somehow, or like kind of ancestors to arthropods. So we know there's a lot of arthropods, and in fact, we can see that uh, a lot of the reconstructions that people make from these Cambrian oceans include things that are all these little arthropods uh, or arthropod related things. So here we have Anomalocaris, one of the most emblematic fossils from the Cambrian. Uh, it's probably related to arthropods. It's actually eating a trilobite, which there's no doubt is an arthropod. Here's Marella coming down these, uh, you know, mountains in the bottom of the ocean. Here's Opabinia, also probably related to these uh, large-bodied arthropods from the Cambrian. And here are Hallucigenia, Aishaia, which are these marine onychophorans, which are probably also related somehow to the arthropod earliest stock. So there's a lot of those things. And one of the questions that people will ask is, Obviously, there's more arthropods because they have a hardened exoskeleton and they might preserve better. But the reality is that these, many of these Cambrian um, um, fossil beds actually have preserved 
a lot of the diversity of things that did not have hardened skeletons, things like parapolans and things like uh, annelids like this waxia over here, or we have things that look more or less like Niderians and sponges. So there's a very extraordinary type of preservation that did not only select those things that had hardened skeletons. And we still know that most of the diversity from those sediments was of arthropod type. So we know there's a lot of arthropods. Here we have again a tree, and you don't have to read the names. It's just to show you that actually these are all representatives of these different Cambrian types of arthropods. And there were a lot of very different types. It's not that we only had a few species of things that look more or less alike. Imagine that you had like, you know, a thousand species of flies. No, there were a lot of things that looked very different. So arthropods had already diversified, not only in number of species, but also in number of body plants when we were back in the Cambrian oceans. So they clearly had their share there of the, a large part of the diversity. And these are you know, very emblematic ar arthropods that you probably all know. Uh, these are trilobites. I'm sure that you can get a lot of these things to show to your students. And there's a few features that are very interesting in these organisms. We already see this theme of having se segments repeated. This is segmentation is one of the advantages that we think that might have given origin to all this arthropod diversity. And I'm gonna talk about segmentation a little bit later on. You can also appreciate these beautiful compound eyes, you know, somehow similar to the ones that you might find in flies nowadays. They're actually pretty different. They were composed of, uh, they had a, a lens form of calcium carbonate but obviously these things had a very different environment than the one that flies uh, live nowadays. But you know, they had all these characteristics that are very typical of arthropods. And it's very interesting also because we see that trilobites, we all are familiar with trilobites, but sometimes we don't appreciate how diverse they were. There's about 10,000 species described. So that's a lot. Things. If you think about all the animal phyla that live nowadays, and this is not a phylum on itself, it's just part of the arthropods, an extinct part of the arthropods. But if you think about living phyla nowadays, we have only about five phyla with more diversity than trilobites had had. And those are uh, mollusks, chordates or vertebrates, uh, nematodes, flatworms, and annelids. Okay, all the other phyla are m far less diverse than trilobites were. Now, here I'm telling you trilobites throughout their entire lifespan in, of the clade, which were several million years, but there's no any other group of animals that even gets close to that when we look at the fossil record, okay? And it's also true, it seems that nowadays is uh, where we, all the clades or most clades have reached the, their maximum diversity. So we're making comparisons at different times, things that there are more species now than there were in the Cambrian oceans or, or the, in the Ordovician or in the Silurian when the, these things lived, okay? Then uh, during the Ordovician, uh, or sorry, the, the Silurian uh, Devonian, so at the end of the Ordovician, something really dramatic happened. Some animals get off the water and start colonizing the land. And that's something very important because they found all these big land masses that had no things living on them. So there was very little competition for all the niches that were forming there. And it was also important, obviously, that plants were colonizing also land. So those animals could have something to eat, the ones that fed on plants and the ones that fed on animals, obviously, they needed to complete the entire uh, ecological pyramid, okay? So we're gonna leave it now here, a little bit in the Silur Devonian, when we know that things are conquering land, the conquer of the land actually happened uh, by different groups of arthropods at the same time, more or less, and those were arachnids, they were myriapods, and also crustaceans that probably gave origin to insects. What I, what I want to do now, we're going to go back a little bit to revisit some of the biogeography and some of the research that we're doing to study how um, the organisms that start evolving in land, then they separated in different land masses. But what I want to do before discussing that is start talking a little bit about 
what are arthropods first? Because, you know, we've been relying on your background knowledge on what's an arthropod. I want to define them a little bit and also what is the main arthropod diversity, the main groups of arthropods. So arthropods are a group of animals that has two characteristics. The first one is segmentation, which means that the body is composed of different regions that are actually, they look alike. So in primitive arthropods, like those trilobites, they had the head section, but then they had all those segments that were exactly the same, internally and externally, or we suppose that internally and externally. Okay? That's the first thing. But there are several other groups of organisms that have this segmentation. And you might think of the earthworms, for example. But another important thing of arthropods is that they develop this other thing that is called tagmosis. And tagmosis, what it does is it takes different groups of segments and re-evolves them, re-adapts them to undertake a new function. And what you can appreciate in many arthropods is that you have different body regions. Some of them without legs, then the middle part might have legs and the anterior part might concentrate all the sensory functions uh, and you know, all the mouth parts, for example. Okay? Now you might want to think that most animals have the mouth in the anterior part of the body, but it's not actually true. Many of you might have used uh, planarians, the freshwater planaria in class, and the head of the planaria has nothing to do with the mouth of the planaria, which is in the ventral side of the animal. Okay? So in this case, many animals have the mouth parts or the mouth in the anterior part of the organism, and that's especially if they move very quickly in their environment. So. Tagmosis in insects, it's uh, also very well known. All insects have three body regions that we call the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. And the thorax is always the one that bears three pairs of legs. But actually what we can see is there are different levels of tagmosis in these insects. This is a primitive insect, uh, one of the Lepismatid, actually, this is a tricolepidion. It's a species, the only species in a family, and this one lives in the uh, redwood forest in the west coast of the US. It's similar to the typical silverfish that you might find around here, but it's actually a different family. And you can appreciate here, more or less, that there is like different body part. You see here, a region is a little bit enlarged. These are three slightly larger segments where they have these three pairs of legs. But actually, you can see here probably that it has these little filaments coming out of the side, which are probably primitive appendages, that they still present in each one of those segments. And later on, in other groups of arthropods, all the appendages or appendage-like structures get completely lost from the abdominal region, and they only have um, the walking legs. And actually, they develop another pair of appendages, which is independent from the legs, which are these wings. And the reason we know they're independent from the legs is because they also have only three segments with three pairs of legs in this thoracic, thoracic region, like all the primitive insects do. And you know, if they had actually, these were equivalent to the legs, what they will have to have is five, or in this case, four, because it only has one pair of legs, but we will have to have five segments. And then the, we will know that one leg has evolve into a wing, but that's not the case. The wings have independent origin. That's why we still have only three segments in the thorax of those flies. So there's a couple other things that are important in our arthropods, and is that they have this hardened exoskeleton made of chitin, and therefore chitin becomes probably one of the most abundant proteins in the world. Uh, this is a cross-section of a millipede just for you to have the idea, often in books we see like these drawings and those drawings sometimes seem mysterious, but this is the actually cross section of a millipede looking at it in the scanning electron microscope. And you see really that they have this exoskeleton, this kind of armor, and here inside is where, wherever they will have their muscles or all the internal viscera. Okay, and then have the legs coming out down there in the bottom of the animal. I think that these images are often more powerful than these schematic drawings that you know, people might not think that they're really, you know, no animal looks really like that schematic that we have up there, but this is a real thing. So 
they have that hardened exoskeleton, that cuticle, that has some impositions on the animals when they want to grow. And most people know that arthropods molt. You know, if they grow into the armor, they can get larger. Whenever they need to do that, they have to shed the cuticle, expand the tissues normally by, you know, drinking a lot of water, and then allow the new larger cuticle to grow on top of that one. And what you can see here is a female scorpion with two babies on her back, and all this white gooey thing is actually the molt of those little scorpions. They've molt on top of the mother, and that's why you find often many of these moles um, in the back of the mother. Okay, and that's something that is very important also. So all arthropods molt at least uh, during a few times in their life cycle. Now there are arthropods that stop molting. They don't molt later on, for example, some of the large centipedes. And there are arthropods that molt throughout their entire life cycles, like the lobsters, for example. Okay, and that's, you know, you could probably tell that because they're arthropods that they have a maximum size and will never outgrow that size. And, you know, lobsters, if you let them live and you don't eat them, they will grow really, really large. So now let's start looking at the diversity of arthropods. But before going into the arthropods, I want to introduce you to two of my best friends. This one, this is the velvet worm. And velvet worms are supposed to be related to arthropods. And we've seen some of those fossils of Aishaia. And Aishaia are supposed to be probably some ancestors of uh, velvet worms, perhaps uh, water bears or tardigrades, and perhaps arthropods. This is a very interesting group of animals that uh, doesn't live in North America. They're actually hard to show your students. My students, whenever I get one to show them, they just like, you know, they fall in love with these animals. Really, really cute. Uh, now there's a great video. One of the things that I use for teaching are videos, commercial videos. There's one that is called um, Blue Planet, which is really good, although it's mostly vertebrates. There's the other one that I use all the time is, how is that called? I forget. Uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you later. And there's a new series also by David Attenberg, which is called The Life on the Underground, which I haven't used that, but I've seen some of the pictures. And there's a beautiful footage of an ornithopteran uh, catching prey by secreting that special glue that they have. Okay? Uh, so some of those things, some of those videos are really good. And when I lecture on these things many times, I stop and I show like short clips, you know, for like a few seconds or 30 seconds and go back to the lecture and really the students get very engaged when they see that. And you can just set up a, a you know, like a bookmark on those DVDs in your computer and, and use that. It's really, really useful. I should have done that for here actually, but I haven't. Um, this is the other one, one of my favorites, the water bears the toughest animals on earth. You can do anything to them, you know, and they will never die unless you're working with them in the lab and then they will die. <laughs> but uh, no, these animals can actually withstand like temperatures that are amazing. You can freeze them and you can take them out of the freezer and they will start moving again. You can keep them in the freezer for 200 years if you want and they will come back to life. And you can you know, place them in almost complete vacuum. Uh, you can expose them to very high levels of x-rays and whatever you want. And these animals are said to survive to anything, basically. Uh, it is true that they, they can do it. They live everywhere also. Any moss that you will find around your school, if you take those mosses, you put them on water for a couple of days, you squeeze the water, and then you look under a microscope, there will be tardigrades that start moving and start, you know. Uh, one of the ways that people do to collect these things, they go to the forest. Is that a question there? I'm just wondering how large are the water bears? They're little. There are a few hundred microns inside, about uh, 200 microns. Some of them get like 500, uh, like half a millimeter, sorry. And, but any regular microscope, no, not the compound microscope, any of these uh, optical microscopes, they will be able to see them. And uh, you know, people will see them moving, which are really cute. Once I was looking at one of these uh, Animal Planet uh, shows, and they were talking about the toughest animals. And they were, you know, they talk about the cockroach, they talk about the mice, and how these things you know, will survive, and nuclear war, <laughs> all these things. And as they were getting to really number one, I just thought, I, you know, that's going to be tardigrades. I don't think they're going to put it on TV, but it's going to be tardigrades. And there it was, you know, an animal planet, tardigrades, the toughest animals on Earth. 
They're really fun to watch. Uh, your students can learn. And I have uh, a few cultures in the lab where we're doing uh, a lot of genetic work on them. So those are related things to arthropods. We think that arthropods evolved from creatures that look like that. They didn't have some of the characters like the hardened exoskeletons. They didn't have the jointed limbs that we find in arthropods. But they came from something that looked pretty much like that. Now what we call arthropods nowadays are five groups, five main groups of organisms. One is pycnogonids or sea spiders, beautiful animals that only live in the oceans. Uh, then the chelicerates, and you might know many of those, like horseshoe crabs, spiders, scorpions, daddy long legs, things like that. Uh, myriapods, the two main groups are centipedes and millipedes. There are some other microscopic ones that uh, are harder to see. And then we have crustaceans with their lobsters and shrimp and crabs and barnacles and things like that. And the insects or hexapods that include insects and some of the more primitive ones that now we don't tend to call insects. And those include <laughs> springtails or proturans like plurans and some of these things. Now I have to tell you that these are the main groups that were, we feature in the exhibit. Uh, those are some of the groups that uh, most textbooks talk about, although they tend to include pignogonids and chelicerates. There's a pretty strong evidence nowadays uh, based on our phylogenetic studies that really hexapods are a derived group of crustaceans that had colonized the land. We're still respecting a little bit more the traditional view. I would envision that within the next few years, once we solve which one is really the group from which hexapods derive, we will change a little bit of that. Okay? And let's see a few pictures of those animals, and I'll just tell you a few facts. These are the beautiful sea spiders, and they can be really colorful. Now, most of them feed on these uh, hydrarians, uh, things related to uh, sea anemones and stuff like that, and they live in shallow waters. They're small, not microscopic as the uh, tardigrades, but they're small and you know they're hard to see. Uh, if you have an opportunity to go to a shore and get some seaweed, uh, some of them might crawl out of the seaweed after a while. Now if you have the opportunity to go to the deep sea or go to Antarctica, you might find these monsters. Pignogon is that the, the leg span might be this big. And I have some in the lab. When they take you to the lab, or you will see them actually in the exhibit, they get really big. And they're really funny creatures because if you look at them, you just have no body. You have all legs. And in fact, the intestines and the testes and everything is inside their legs. And then they have these proboscis with the mouth located up here, these calicers for grabbing the food or attaching to the nadirians. And they have another interesting feature is that the males of many species carry this special type of appendages that are called ovigers, where they carry the eggs and the babies. The males do that. Very few arthropod males do that. Uh, so seahorses do that, invertebrates, but most animals you know that it's the females that take care of the babies. Uh, except in humans, right? It's the men that do that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The other group is chelicerates, and you know many of these uh, things. They're a really important group of carnivores. Most of them feed off other animals. Some of them have venoms, like scorpions and spiders, very different types of venoms. None of the other groups have venoms. People tend to freak out a little bit when they see. Uh, some large uh, arachnids and people think that daddy long legs have very powerful venoms. That's not true. They don't have any venom glands. Um, you'll see some live uh, vinegaroons upstairs in the collection, in the uh, exhibit. And vinegaroons are very interesting. They're very mean looking creatures. They're not really that bad. They don't have venom, but they secrete acetic acid and that's where the name comes from. They can squirt acetic acid to you know, defend themselves. Uh, these are amplipeded, some of my favorite, well, my, t my favorites are these ones, daddy long legs. Uh, that's a lot of the work that I do, but uh, amplipeded are pretty cool. These animals can get big, and they're really mean looking. There's some pictures there of the calisters. They have all these spines, you know, it's just in their hands. It's really, really dramatic animal. And it was really, I have this funny story about when I was in the Amazon, there was a, uh, Indian American from the Amazon, and he's a, actually a pro almost professional herpetologist. He always collects with um, one of the herpetologists that lives there in Colombia, in the Amazon, 
and he grabs all kinds of venomous snakes and poisonous uh, frogs and stuff like that. And I was collecting there, and I saw one of these big amplipedids, and I just told him, actually, just come hold it while I go get my camera. And he's like, no way, I'm not touching that. You know? Like, come on, you're catching those snakes, you know, that they can kill you, and this thing is not going to do anything. He will not dare to put a finger on it, you know. There's a lot of myth with arachnids. Uh, they're actually a very important part of the ecosystem. They have really interesting behaviors. There's some to the scorpions that have this phoretic uh, behavior. They can just grab on to some animals that fly or run away and just like move from continent to continent just by holding from one of the little calisers. And if you look at pseudoscorpions, they actually look like scorpions without the tail, except that they're much smaller. And for a long time, they thought that those two groups, they just looked alike, you know, but as a, as a convergence, evolutionary convergence. Now it seems that actually those two groups might be closer related phylogenetically. So that overall shape is inherited from their common ancestors. And within daddy long legs, these are by far the favorites. I've been uh, putting a lot of effort in my lab, working on this little group of tiny daddy long legs that don't have long legs, so they're short like daddy long legs. <laughs> and, uh, they're called Scythe of Tommy. You can appreciate the size of these things because you have a bar there, which is a scale bar. It's one millimeter. So these species go from one millimeter in size from the animal to the largest one, which is five millimeters, half a centimeter, really small animals. And we've been doing a lot of work on biogeography. And I will talk a little bit about this thing later on. There's a lot of species to be described. Uh, with one of my students, we've been doing a survey in South America. There's something like seven species described for the entire tropical region of South America. We have 35 new species sitting in the lab to be described. And that's before really doing intensive field work. So that gives you an appreciation also for how little we know about many of these uh, small arthropods that live in the soil litter. This is actually a species that we described a couple of years ago from Portugal. When we're in arthropods also, I'm going to give you the same pie chart that I gave you before when we compared the different phyla. Now what I'm comparing is these five main groups of arthropods. And you can see how pygnogonids don't even show up in the graph. There's just a few hundred species there. And when you're comparing to the million species of arthropods, it's a really small group. And you have two groups that are more or less abundant, crustaceans and, and hexapods or insects. Uh, myriapods are really small compared to other things. And then the largest group by far, 85% of the described species of arthropods are insects, exclusively terrestrial or freshwater. Remember, many insects have life stages that happen in the freshwater, uh, but they don't go below sea level. And within insects, you might know the big four. Big four are beetles or coleoptera, which have about 375,000 <coughs> sorry known species. You have flies and mosquitoes and these things that are called diptera. Uh, hymenoptera, which include bees, wasps, uh, ants, and things like that. And then the lepidoptera, basically butterflies and moths. <coughs> sorry. So those are the big four groups of arthropods. Sorry, groups of insects. Uh, there's several other groups of insects or hexapods. And some of them are not very well known. This is actually a very charismatic species of springtail that we photographed in New Zealand. And, you know, and that's a dipleur. And these are very primitive insects. And these might recall to some of you earwigs, but it's actually not an earwig. It's a much more primitive group of um, arthropods. And some, there's many other orders. You know, I couldn't show you here diversity of all insects. It's more than 30 orders. But this is just to give you an idea of some of the very different body plants that you might find within this group of large group of arthropods. Another of my best friends, these are uh, centipedes and millipedes. I do a lot of work on centipedes. This is actually a new species we photograph in Western Australia in January. Um, and centipedes came in two main shapes. These ones, these are long leg, really fast animals that actually can uh, you know, come out in daylight and they have special adaptations to avoid evaporation, which is something that happens in animals that live on land. And these other ones that are normally, uh, all the other ones, they're more obscure. They're always underground or underneath stones and they don't tend to come out during the daylight. 
and they go from 15 pairs of legs to something like 171. Uh, but actually, you don't have all the numbers of legs. You have 15, 21, 23, or more than 38 or 39 or something like that. So, and that's uh, very typical to define the different groups of centipedes. And centipedes are predators. All of them are predators. They have venomous glands. And if you've seen some of those big uh, uh, scolopendras from the Caribbean, those can you know, inflict a lot of pain when they bite. Now you're not gonna die from it. It's just like a you know a big uh, sting, but uh, they're not that dangerous to us. Now they're very they're very uh, voracious predators. If you go to see some of those videos that have been put on the internet, there is this large centipede catching a flying bat, and that's something that happens in some caves in Venezuela. I'm sure that if you show that to your students, they're really gonna love it. Uh, so centipedes can be really, you know, they eat a lot of uh, vertebrate prey, actually. They can eat mice, mice, they can eat frogs and stuff like that, lizards. So some of those get really mean. They're not that bad to us. And then the other large group is millipedes. So centipedes are all, all venomous and all um, predators. Millipedes are all vegetarian. They are more peaceful and they actually very important part of any terrestrial ecosystems to <coughs> move organic matter. Okay, they really recycle a lot of the organic matter from the, from the floor of the forests. Crustaceans is another group of animals that uh, were probably very familiar with many forms like lobsters and barnacles. There's actually the most diverse group of arthropods, not in terms of number of species, but in terms of different adaptations, what they've been able to do with their bodies. We have things like these remipids, fascinating creatures that only live in very few uh, places in the world, always in seawater that has fresh water on top and is only accessible from continents. They've never been found in open seawater. They're always in these ankyaline caves. They're found in some lava tubes and these caves that are found in, in Yucatan or in Bahamas, Western Australia, Canary Islands. Really interesting biogeographic questions there are how these things go to live in all these very isolated places along the earth. If you look at it, it actually looks like a marine centipede. You know, it's like all the segments are the same and they have just their, their um, appendages transformed from swimming there. But we have a lot of different types of adaptations and you have even crustaceans that are not even recognized as a crustacean that easily. And in fact, for the longest time, barnacles and goose barnacles were thought to be something else until somebody saw their larvae. And they saw that their larvae is actually the same type of the larvae that we find in other uh, crustaceans, okay? Probably uh, your kids might be familiar with uh, pill bugs. If you go to the exhibit and if you take them to the exhibit, it's really cool because there are some of these giant pill bugs that live in the deep sea. And I think it's great to, put the, to place those specimens in exhibit because they're familiar with these ones and now you can tell them about how evolution can change you know, body sizes by living in different environments. Uh, so look for those big pill bugs in the collection. There's one, the largest one on the tree that is on the wall and there's a couple more on the jars. I'm sure you all know this one. If you don't recognize it like this, you might recognize it like that. <laughs> very important, you know. This, this is to bring uh, also the, the point that crustaceans are very important for the economy. There's some fisheries, you know, a lot of things uh, going on. Massachusetts has great fisheries for lobster or the entire uh, New England, but also shrimp and many other things. Goose barnacles here are not very appreciated. They're really very appreciated in Europe, especially in Spain where I come from. Uh, very expensive and, and crustaceans have a very important impact in the economy. What I do with these things also is not only looking at the diversity, I look how these things are related to each other. And this is a little bit of that trick concept that I gave you before, which I didn't spend much time because we couldn't read uh, the, number, the, the names very well. But this is basically what we've been doing for the last few years by studying the evolution and the morphology and the DNA of arthropods and comparing those things. It's trying to come up with an evolutionary tree that relates all those arthropod lineages. And this is the basic angular tree. Now we have a big problem, is that we scientists disagree on which one of these three topologies is correct or better reflects the history of arthropods. If you realize, 
all these three things are basically the same and rooted tree. But if we place the root between pignogonids and the rest, we get this thing. So the root is placed between pignogonids and the rest. If we place the root in position two, it gives us one group including pignogonids and chelicerates and the other one including the rest. And if we place the root in position three, we get this other one. Now, the underlying unrooted tree is identical. So all our data sets are pretty much agreeing that that is the unrooted tree. Now, once you place the root by including other groups that are related to them, and then the evolutionary implications, the evolution of the characters changes completely. And that's where we're arguing now. You know, many of these things that we're doing in science are not resolved. Trees are only hypothesis of how those things are related. And I know that sometimes we get attacked because we disagree with each other, therefore, you know, uh, evolution didn't happen or something like that. No, it's just, you know, science, it's a process, uh, things change. And things change because we get more data or new information that might make us revisit our previous hypothesis. And I think it's good. Yeah, you have a question? Uh, two. <laughs> okay. The first one is, are, are these trees based on morphology or DNA? They're based on DNA and morphology, many of those, Both. so, yeah. Okay, and the other question is, um, these trees, um, are they based on numerical cluster analysis? Yes, they all, all they, they all are, because yeah. a lot then depends which paradigm you use to. Exactly, okay. yeah. Uh, what happens is that in the past, trees were proposed without any numerical analysis, without looking at data. Somebody came and said, I'm so smart that I know that this and this go together. And that's so smart, Pe people most of the time were, wrong. well, not most of the time, but, uh, but often those things you know, needed to be tested. And these are the underlying trees that we're getting by analyzing molecular data and morphological data, by analyzing real data. There's differences in the methodology, there might be slightly different results based on the data that we use. Some people might use ribosomal genes, other people might use uh, protein coding genes, other people might use them all at the same time, okay? So there's slight difference there and I think that's where we're trying to make progress by adding more and more information, many of these relationships become more and more stable. For example, this crustacean hexapod relationship that you see on every tree here, that everyone agrees now, pretty much everyone. 10 years ago, no way. That's, that was heresy, you know, because everyone thought that hexapods and myriapods were together because they have a lot of the same adaptations that those arthropods had by conquering land, okay? And a lot of people thought the crustaceans went with chelicerates. So now nobody's arguing that. But actually, almost every textbook still reflects the, that old thing that has been you know, changing the last 10 years. So you will see a lot of revision here, and especially in higher relationships of organisms. So uh, let's move on. I'm, I'm almost there. I think that we have another 10 minutes because we start a little late. And, and then you're going to see some of these things in the lab, and, or at least how we infer some of these things and the, the tools that we use. The last thing I want to tell you about, tell you about is uh, some of the research that we're doing on biogeography. And people ask me often, what is biogeography? Well, you know, we're trying to resolve in biogeography, and here we're using a little group of arachnids, that one that I showed you before, those short legs, daddy long legs. And so these are groups of animals that are very old. We can infer uh, with the fossil record and other things that those animals were on land about 400 million years ago. That's a lot of time. And we also have some other ecological information and biological information that tell us that these animals do not disperse through water barriers. So they cannot cross from one continent to another. Nowadays, they've never colonized any <coughs> islands that have appeared in the middle of the oceans. But they live in all islands and all large <coughs> islands that had once been connected to continents. So they're in Madagascar, they're in New Zealand, they're in Sri Lanka, because those large islands were once part of continents. But they're not in Galapagos, they're not in Hawaii, they're not in the Canary Islands. Okay, so that's what we're looking for. A very old group of organisms, they cannot cross these masses of water. Why? Because we want to try to look whether the current distribution pattern 
matches the ideas of the continents drifting and all that. So here you're looking at the current distribution of this group of organisms. And the different symbols actually reflect different families. And I don't want you to look at everything other than you get the impression that these things live almost everywhere in the world, not everywhere, but in all the continents and large continental islands. And they are restricted actually to certain areas where we have a lot of rainfall. So they have some ecological restrictions. They're in Northern South America, and they're not in this drier area. They're not in all this dry area of Africa, but they're in general everywhere where there's good rainfall and in all land masses. And we've been studying the evolution of this group of opiliones or daddy long legs. And by doing that, we've had to go to basically all those places. We've been doing field work everywhere in all the continents. And I take often my students there so they get exposed to the field work, which I think is a very important part of understanding biodiversity and understanding biology. So we go to all these places. Here's a picture in Africa. Here's one in Sri Lanka. And what we do is we uh, take the leaf litter, this is one of my students with me in the Amazon, and we uh, take all this cover of the leaf, or part of the cover of the leaf litter that is in the bottom, we put that in these uh, sieves that has like a three millimeter sieve in the middle, we just shake that thing, the animals fall off with the small particles of sediment, we put them in white, white trays, and then very patiently we look for these little animals to move out. And now this is something that you can do also to show diversity because everywhere in the forest here you will find a lot of animals by doing an exercise like that and people will see spiders and centipedes and other things. Here we're looking for something specifically, these little animals, they're the same color of the litter, they're really hard to see so we spend a lot of hours looking at that. Here's with my student that graduated last week so now she's Dr. Boyer. Um, and here is uh, also with her in Japan and she has a lot of patience to look for these things. I have less patience, so I have to start doing other activities like <laughs> taking pictures of the animals and other things. And you can do that actually everywhere. Here's uh, another filter that we did last year to the west coast of the US where there's this beautiful redwood forest and there's also a lot of species living there. Many of them are new. So we don't need to go to you know, Indonesia to describe new species. A lot of species to be described in our backyards. A couple of years ago, there was this article in the New York Times of a new centipede species that was discovered in Central Park. You know, I mean, <laughs> how many people have been in Central Park before? A lot of things to be discovered, a lot of things that we can get uh, students engaged with. Uh, Ron is actually going to give you one of the tours later on, I think the one to the collections. Um, and what we do with those animals then is derive these evolutionary trees. And what you can see here are the colors that represent the different families of the animals. And I apologize, I realize that maybe this orange and this yellow is not very well perceived there. But basically here you have one family that lives in all this temperate Gondwanan area, one part of the earth that once was surrounding Antarctica. And we'll see how that matches. And here, for example, we have one family that lives in Southeast Asia, only in the islands of Southeast Asia from Thailand, and then in, in uh, Sumatra, Borneo, Java, Sulawesi, all those islands there. Now, when we place that tree or those distributions in a former map of the Earth during the Jurassic, what we see is that things make a lot of sense. These red things now are in completely disparate parts of the world. And in fact, you can imagine how these ones from Chile are much more closely related to the ones in Northern South America than they are, or closely geographically, than they are to the ones in Sri Lanka, which ended up up here in the map. You know? So that's what we're doing. And we're seeing that all these things really match the Earth history. So we're trying to do at the same time the biology, comparing the biology and evolution of those organisms with something that often we forget and is very important, that those organisms also evolve with the land and the environments where they live on. Okay, so now we can explain how these things from southern South America are really closely related to the ones in New Zealand. Because once they had all this area, actually Antarctica was not frozen back then, and I will bet anything I have that those animals also lived in Antarctica. You know, because they had to. They lived in all the territories surrounding Antarctica. Just to repeat this thing in a simpler map, just I took two of the families. Again, the reconstruction of this circumantarctic distribution. Or the other one that was very interesting, the ones that we found in northern South America, in West Africa, and actually in this area of the US, which is Florida. 
and the, those things again, they separated and they ended up giving us these distributions that now seem you know, pretty far away, or especially the red one where it's all over the map. Okay? If you realize the red one, these things are surrounding another family that are, is the one in Southeast Asia. There's never been any exchange of fauna there because those land masses have never been in common. Okay, so this is the type of evolutionary work that we can do with these things. Again, it's very important to emphasize that I want to take my students to the field. I've been showing you pictures of some of my graduate students that come with me, but I also teach a course on invertebrate diversity, and we take them also to see the coral reefs. And this is uh, last year, a couple of years ago in Bahamas. You know when you know I I want to bring the animals in. The, not the animals, sorry, the students <laughs> in the water. I want them to touch things. I want them to see things. And there's different levels that we can do that. You know, obviously, not everyone has the resources to bring their undergraduates to Bahamas, but we can take them to the backyard here and try to see things. You know, you'll see snails, they'll see other groups of organisms that will be very interesting. And we'll get them engaged into this life cycle. So I think that's pretty much all I have to say. I I'm just giving you here some summaries about why arthropods is one of the, my main topics. Although I work on many other groups of invertebrates also. I like invertebrates in general, so basically work on everything. But, uh, but you know, arthropods are very important because they're a really large part of um, the diversity. So they have a lot of species. They're a very large part of the biomass. They're also, they live everywhere. And they have done that actually since very early times of animal evolution. They conquered the land during the Silura Devonian. They have, they have occupied since then all the niches. And then they're also very interesting for these particular things that they're built with those segments in a modular fashion. And they, by having virtually many segments that look alive, they can derive some of those and adapt them to very different functions. And that's when they've developed different appendages and they can adapt to all so all those different environments where they live. So that's pretty much it. I mean, the other things are just to have the five lineages and that they're an excellent model for any kind of study, evolutionary and otherwise, also to see how organisms function in their environments. So that's pretty much it. I want to obviously acknowledge some of, first of all, you for being here, uh, paying attention to these uh, talks on arthropods and being interested in, in improving some of those things that you are going to be teaching to your students. And my lab, which you know, I have a great lab of people that are doing a lot of the work uh, that I'm showing here. And obviously, some of the sources of funding that allow us to do these things, which is very important, especially the National Science Foundation. And George Patnam is a donor at the Museum of the Comparative Zoology that funds a lot of our field work, for example. Uh, which is another good way to find sources of taking students uh, out, trying to find somebody interested in that and getting some money from them. Galapagos has originated in the middle of the oceans. It's never been connected to a landmass, and therefore, if these things cannot disperse through water, they would never get there. Uh, the things that get there, for example, spiders get there, and spiders can balloon with their silks. Spiders are very good dispersers, or things that fly, you know beetles and all sorts of insects uh, or things that can raft on, on other things on the ocean. They also will get there. That's, uh, yes, because they're in all the con because we know that they cannot cross those barriers of water and they're found in all land masses. They had to be there when all continents form part of one big land mass. Yes. Yeah. Piggybacking on that, uh, they don't, tr humans haven't been able to disperse them through the travel, you know, with boats and planes and stuff? Yes, they have. And we, we are able to disperse anything we want. But these animals are cryptic, little, uh, they're hard to find. So I think we've got lucky there. We've got lucky because they're not dispersing the typical garden flowers. They will only live in very, very pristine forests. They're not really inhabited by humans often. So that's a big difference. So they're not brought in on like, like plants and they're vegetables not, and stuff that other some have been brought Not at all. Only primary forests. If you take a forest, you cut it, and you start planting their things, those things are, are gone. They're just, you won't find it there. Yes? Prior to the 
We do not know that exactly. We know there are some Ediacarans, which is a whole group of animals that actually live. This is very recent data from China uh, fossil beds that they live through that barrier. So they just extend into the Cambrian. But uh, many of the Ediacarans, we really don't know how they relate to the fauna that we know of this. There were things that looked like sponges, and there were things that looked like Nadirians. Mm -hmm. But a lot of these other things, we don't really know how they relate. Their anatomy looks very different. All right, thanks for coming. <laughs>